Hey y'all, uh, Paula here, and I'm going to read some poems for you. Um, I did the best I could with the light in this room. Um, I'm sitting right next to a really big, beautiful window, um, but it's raining out, so I had to bring in some other light. I'm not sure how well this will pick up, but I'm going to do my best. And I was trying from the beginning of this quarantine, and we quarantined early, um, because I was sick and my husband is older and um, even before I think we were calling it a pandemic we were staying inside because we could see what was coming um, and I started um, doing videos of my poems early it, it was a project I've been wanting to do anyway because poems are meant to be heard and as lovely as it is to read them on the page and as important as it is to craft them on the page right line breaks are really really important word choice um, there's lots of resonance and nuance there should be in a really good poem that you can see on the page but poems are an oral form they're an oral tradition they're meant to be heard and i think um, putting them on the page has tied them to academia for so long and made them really scary um, and people have started convincing themselves they don't like poetry and they can't understand poetry so I thought it seemed important to get back to people being able to hear poems um, uh, like I said I was sick when it started and it was kind of exhausting to do and I <laughs> also got really tired pretty quickly of seeing my own face <laughs> And it's been lovely to see so many other people posting their poems. It's really wonderful. All over the world, there's a hashtag International Poetry Circle. Um, locally here in Columbus, which is a great, great, great poetry town. Um, uh, what Sandy Fein, um, I was thrilled to see Chuck Sammons, who's the president of our Ohio Poetry Association. He started um, recording. Um, he even wore a tuxedo in one of his and poured champagne. This is as dressed up as I get, but I did put on my hoop earrings um, and I put on all my rings. Whenever I do a poetry feature, that's a ritual for me. There's there's something about putting the, the rings on my fingers that, that calms me and centers me. Um, and I am going to read a few poems because I decided now I'm only going to um, post a video once a week because I want to channel my energy into writing new poems. I was... I had two poems already at the end of March. I kept writing when April started and I said, holy moly, I'm doing a 30-30. <laughs> so I'm actually hoping at this point to um, have uh, a new chapbook at least um, by the time, you know, we're all set free from our cages here. <laughs> um, and it's been a good productive time for me, but this is the way I operate normally. I've, I've never been afraid of dark times, never ever. Um, to me, it's a fallow time. Uh, spring tells us every single year that the world will bloom again. It will blossom. We're in the midst of a blossoming now, even as we're in the midst in our country here, um, in the midst of, of um, we're in the midst of spring, all the while we're in the midst of a pandemic. Um, if you're not creating, that's okay. That fallow time is always important. I tell people always, always, I get frustrated with other poets um, and artists who get frustrated when they're not writing or creating because it's all creative time. It all is that deep, fallow, um, you know, going under is, is a lovely, lovely thing. And it's very productive. Never underestimate how how very, very productive that, that rich, deep, you know interior time is it's important so if you're not writing now it's okay you will be later um i wanted to highlight too i'm scheduled in july to um to feature on my, the artwork we collect here um on columbus collects if you don't know what that is you might check it out um i i wish they showed up better the work behind me i decided to sit in this little corner today um, these pieces are pretty big um, I have two pieces here that we picked up at the Cardboard Art Festival in Orlando, Florida. So shout out to Orlando and Dina Bina and so many others. I have, of course, um, 
Linda McClanahan here. She's all over our house. She's a favorite um, Columbus artist. Um, this piece is mine and the piece up here is mine. Um, that's called Rise. It's about the rise of the divine feminine and I am convinced to my core that yes, even what we're going through now is part of the rise of the divine feminine. That's deep, deep work I've been doing for several years now. It's really important and I'm, and I'm doing a lot of prose work too and dream work um, related to that. But underneath that here, I hope my pointing is coming out okay, that's that's Jason Kaufman, who is also a um, poet and visual artist. Um, so shout out to all the creatives, the musicians, the painters, the poets, and I'm going to stop talking now and just start reading. So these are all poems I've done since uh, since since the quarantine started, and um, it the first two were March poems, and then it moves right into April. And I have to get this all recorded at one time and in a great big hurry because <laughs> I got a date with my husband in the living room later on here. <laughs> so I hope this is picking up sound. The first poem, Gazel for Our Time, Beloved. I don't normally do forms. The Gazel is an Arabic form, beautiful, a lot of Sufi poetry. Um, you might take the time to look that up. We reach out to touch the hand of the beloved we reach up to touch the face of the beloved. In learning what we cannot touch, we find what we most crave. In you, in me, beloved. I see now what is holy in you and long for it. I see now what is holy in me, O beloved. Separated and alone, we sing to one another. From windows and balconies, we sing to the beloved. We touch our screens, reaching out, O beloved. We hold phones to our ears, O beloved. Beloved, O grief, O mourning, O what we cannot have. In this we know what we most love, O beloved. More than we knew, you touched us. And more than we knew, we reached for you, sweet beloved. We held you all along in our hands, held your gaze in our mirror. We know you, we see you, beloved. Fruit. This was written for my grandbaby, who I miss so much. I had her in mind when I did this. Um, fruit. I learned how to clean my groceries on the same day the hurt began. The missing so much it hurt, but I was still trying to ignore that a while longer. And besides, here were the groceries to tend to, piled on the floor in a room we just don't use anymore. God knows how many hands have touched it, shipping to shelves to check out to here. The man on the video said to wipe the plastic packaging, pull the saltine sleeves from their tainted cardboard box, wash your produce like you wash your hands. So I let the fruit tumble to the sink, each piece a soft splash of the warm, sudsy water. Oranges first, big and round and bright as never you mind. I held one in my hand, cradling it like my granddaughter's head, sweetly, carefully, washing it like I might wash her cheeks. Don't you cry, sweetheart. Don't you cry. And was it her I whispered to, or was it me, now dipping the perfect piece of fruit into the rinse and setting it softly on the counter to wipe dry later? Funny how everything I do now extends to something else, every touch, every thought, every worry, each fond thought. Making love to my husband, now like sending love to the world. Kisses blowing past his cheek to the wind outside. Every moan, every sigh, a memory tied to every possible part of my life. It's not theory anymore that we're all connected, that everything is. And here, now, reaching for a lemon bouncing through the suds, I hold it in my hand. Think, now this was the size of her head when she was born. And so it was. I said so then, only called it a peach, fuzzy and pink, premature. I hold this lemon the way I held her then, tenderly, tearful, 
some combination of awe and love. How bright is this tiny sweet lemon? How yellow, how lovely these tiny dimpled pucks on its skin. I reach for each newly cleansed orange, each lemon, each honey crisp apple, dry it with a soft cotton cloth saying, don't you worry now, everything will be all right. And I let myself believe that's true, piling the fruit perfectly into green glass bowls. I have two poems about breath, which um, I've been thinking a lot about breath. I've been connected to breath for a long, <laughs> long time. Um, you know, it's part of Tai Chi practice and Qigong and meditation practice, focus on the breath. And um, breath is so easily lovely, lovely, <laughs> lovely, <laughs> so easily and nicely um, tied to um, wind right, as an archetype and the breath of the world, the way trees, you know, are the lungs of the earth and the earth itself is trying so hard to breathe right now. So, um, breath. This is how the world has always lived, lonely and afraid. Each wave of terrible news, an intake of breath, sharp, a steel bright sword to our side. The long, slow, angry letting go prepares us for what bitter thing comes next. Sunrise, laughter, rain. Crocus, wise and delicate, blooms through death again and again. We can be that bursting. This is how the earth has always lived. This is what it is. Earth cracks open, we reach for light. Darkness comes, we reach for light once more. And that led me um, almost straight into the second poem, which Susan Glassmeyer helped me with. Um, she sent me a lovely video um, with an, uh, a video exercise that linked to an exercise about breath. So the title is actually a quote from that I picked up from that video. Hey, Susan. <laughs> um, what happens at the end of the inhale? What happens at the end of the inhale? Nothing, really. A pause, a lingering, a glance toward the window. Outside, magnolia blossoms, battening all day, have not yet burst. There's only this, a deepening color, a slow unfolding, the soothing reminder to let things go. Of course, this is um, Adam Brandemiel inspired this. Every time, every time I say a name <laughs> and doing this video thing, I, I, I was I keep thinking of Romper Room. Remember, if you're old enough to remember that, she held up the magic mirror and said, um, "Hi there, Susan. Hi Adam. Hi Carrie. Hi Melanie and Steve. <laughs> Hi Chuck. Um, hi Therese and Allison and Maria. Um, all the people we're reaching out to now." Um, but Adam and I, a, a couple of years ago, did a, uh, it turned out to be fantastic. Um, we did a, a, um, an exhibit at the Ohio Department, um, ODNR, Ohio Department of Natural Resources, um, where we used Adam's photo fo um, photos. He's a wonderful bird photography, bird photographer, um, and my bird poems. And, and the ODNR has a lovely gallery, so it was really nice. So Adam just posted a bird that should not normally be in Ohio. He posted that on his wall, um, and that straight away inspired this poem. I've been trying to write a poem about vagrants for years. Vagrants are birds that are blown off course, um, usually accidentally, usually by a storm. Sometimes it's a genetic mutation that causes, you know, sort of faulty wiring. Um, but I've been trying to write that poem for a long time. And when Adam posted that picture, um, I finally put this poem together. This morning, a hooded oriole arrived in Ohio and settled into a blossoming cherry tree. Strange and beautiful, this clashing orange bird, black mask, wild explosion of pink all around him. He too 
is in seclusion. They're called vagrants, these birds blown so far off course. They rarely survive. Not long ago, a hurricane blew a masked booby north of the Gulf, landing on a beach in Cape Cod. He died just a few days later. It's the young adults, mainly, so unused to traveling at all, who tend to stray like this. Didn't we all once? Didn't we hope to? Not all the accidentals die. Darwin's finches bloomed like these pink blossoms. Hawaiian honey creepers sing all across that strand of jewel islands. They survive all the ways that they can, these spirits blown off course. And when they don't, they ride the currents that caress us all, whispering when we let ourselves hear, don't you worry, loves, we're still here. And this is the last poem. I wrote this late last night, early this morning. This is called Hyacinth. All these poems, by the way, are, <laughs> you know, I'm writing quickly, you know, and, and steadily, and they're all prone to revision later. Some of them have already been revised. I'm tweaking as I go along, but that's the point of a 30-30 is to produce as much as you can and, and worry about figuring it out later. Um, so Hyacinth. Walking down the center of the street, keeping a wide berth from everything, I marveled at how many flowers were blooming than I'd realized. Yellow and white, daffodils mainly, set against the greenest grass I'd ever witnessed. The dog I saw ahead, to my right, was tied to a stake that looked strong enough to hold him, so I wished even him well this evening. We'd eyed each other quietly, and I felt his sorrow. Red fawn boxer, yellow cord, off-white stake. He, too, contained in a way he wasn't built for. He barked once. I know, I told him, I feel it too, old friend. He couldn't bear the sympathy and barked again, strained against the cord, and for the first time, I doubted we were made for these times. Turning the corner, I saw pink and purple in the yard across the street, hyacinth. I made my way toward them, refusing to let my heart be broken. That's it. I have a date for my with my husband now. <laughs> so, uh, be well, have faith, have courage, and I'll see you next week. I'm going to keep recording, uh, posting poems and recording just the audio so I can stay focused on putting my energy into new work. And if you like this, I'm going to keep doing it. I might keep doing it even if you don't. <laughs> so I'll see you next week. All right. And now we go off, right? Bye-bye.